So this is an approach, as I said on the first day, that arose from my medical work when I realized that when it came to people's mental health issues, physical health challenges and uh, addictions or in relationship problems, whatever, whatever they came to me to the office with, um, the biological narrow explanations that I learned in medical school were helpful but not sufficient. And that to really get to the bottom of problems and, and to help people move past them, I had to ask the right questions. Now, so that's what really it is. It's compassionate inquiry. It, it's just really a way of questioning, but it's not just a way of questioning. It's also a way of bringing in certain perspectives for the person's consideration, a way that they haven't thought about things before, that that might be helpful for them to think that way about them. And the method very much reflects me and my personal style. I'm not a, I, I'm a systems thinker like Dick is, but I'm not nearly as methodical as, um, and I say that neither critically of myself nor of Dick, but my method is not just as methodical. I'm, I'm, more, I'm sort of more, what is my intuition telling me at the moment? So I kind of just go with that. So compassion inquiry as it evolved and as it was helped to be um, systematized by other people working with me, is not as linear and as sequential as I understand uh, internal family systems to be. It's more like what arises in the moment and uh, what needs to be asked or said in any particular moment. Now, the intention is to help a person become in contact with themselves in the present moment. Because trauma uh, is all about losing contact with ourselves and actually fleeing the present moment. And all the manifestations of physical illness, addiction, and mental health issues are ways of really not being in the present moment. So how do we bring people into the present moment and how do we help them develop the capacity to be in the present moment, not reacting to the past, which has to do with emotional competence, which I'll talk more about later. Now, any, I usually begin my retreats or seminars by playing a song by my guru, Johnny Cash. And really, I have two gurus. One of them is Buddha, the other is Johnny Cash. And they both said the same thing. Uh, in his song, um, In Your Mind, that was written by uh, Roseanne Cash, actually. And Johnny Cash recorded it towards the end of his life. He sings, um, One foot on Jacob's ladder, another in the fire, it all goes down in your mind. Jacob's ladder, of course, is the stairway to heaven uh, from the Bible, uh, from the Old Testament. The fire is hell. And whether we're ascending to heaven or whether we're consigned to perdition in hell, all has to do with our minds. It all happens with our minds, which is, of course, was the Buddha's basic teaching. The first uh, statement in his um, Dhammapada, which is the collection of his sayings, is that uh, everything is mind in the lead. And so basically, with the minds, we create the world that we live in. So for example, if I perceive the world as hostile, as against me, as everybody trying to exploit me, um, as even my friends, want to take away my house and my wealth and my wife. I'm going to live in a world where I have to be aggressive and selfish and very defensive and very vigilant and uh, almost paranoid. In other words, I'll become president of the United States because <laughs> it was almost your most previous president who actually said that that's the way the world is. So if I live in a world where I believe that there's love and goodness and connection and potential and suffering, but also redemption and healing, I, I inhabit a very different universe and I create a very different universe. So that's the Buddha's essential teaching, or one of his essential teachings. And what the Buddha didn't say, and what Dick and I both work with, is that before with our worlds we create our minds, sorry, before with our minds we create the world, the world creates our minds. And that happens very early in life. In fact, in my understanding, it begins already in uterus. 
So behind Dick's uh, IFS approach, there's a theory of mind. And he talked about that very eloquently yesterday. I have a different theory of mind, um, even, even as so many of our insights uh, coincide. I don't see the mind as, I don't see Israel as being born with all these different parts. What I see is as being born are certain capacities and uh, certain needs. And the extent to which the world meets our needs, those capacities will, will unfold. The extent to which the world frustrates those needs and even tramples on them in the case of trauma, those capacities will be suppressed or sent in the wrong direction. Parts work, for all its efficacy, and it really does work. I mean, we saw that beautifully yesterday with Brad, uh, Brad's work. That doesn't am amount to me to an explanation of how the mind actually works. So, for example, and I, and I, I took these notes yesterday, and, and um, what I'm saying here is not in refutation of what Dick said, but it used to give you a different point of view. So Dick mentioned yesterday this part that comes online that says no, or an age one and a half or two, which in our wisdom we called the terrible twos. Which, by the way, is a very adult-centric point of view, isn't it? You know, why is it terrible? Because it's inconvenient for us adults. It'd be so much nicer if the kids could just say yes all the time. Hey, it's time for dinner, yes. But nature doesn't do that. That no is not a part that comes online. From my perspective, it's the developmental necessity. That, that, and we have our developmental stages that we go through. So... Why is, and I'm just exploring one particular example that Dick mentioned yesterday. Why is it important that we learn how to say no? In fact, why don't we say yes before we learn how to say no? It's because developmentally and throughout the lifetime, if we don't know how to say no, our yeses don't mean anything at all. So for the yes to be meaningful, we have to be able to say no. And furthermore, will which is our capacity to know what we prefer and to stay with it despite disappointment and setback and frustration. That's what will is. It has to develop. Nobody's born with will as such. Not a developed will. Now, for the child's will to develop in the face of the overwhelming power and um, physical strength and domination of the parent, nature has to put up a little fence, like, like you would put a little fence around a, a little plant that you were growing and you didn't want the rabbits or the deer to eat it. That little fence to protect the child's incipient developing will is that no, that resistance, that automatic resistance to any sense of coercion or authority. And behind that no, the child can now figure out his own preferences or her own preferences. And this is what the brilliant friend of mine, the psychologist Gordon Neufeld, calls counter will. So that no does not resent for me a new, a new person coming in, a new part coming in. It's a developmental necessity. Now, what are our other developmental necessities? So, so we have these developmental necessities. And, and, and what happens with that no, if the parents push on it too much, guess what? The more you push on something, the more pushback you get. So how these capacities develop or don't develop depends very much on interaction with the environment. And here again is where Dick and I share something. We really see the individual as developing and unfolding in the context of a system. So we don't focus just on the individual, but we look at the individual in context. <laughs>